I do love to preach. At the same time, I want to tell you that there's no theme that so intimidates me as the theme of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. There's so much in it. It means so much. It carries so much weight. It has so much to encourage us as Christians. It's a difficult theme to speak about, and yet it's a wonderful theme to speak about, and one that you want to talk about as much as possible, but at the same time, it is intimidating in its way. I'm going to talk about the natural subject for this time of year, this time of day, this time of month, uh, the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. The resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. My text is taken from 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 8. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 8. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Let me read it once again. Remember, that's what we're doing now. Remember that Jesus Christ of the son of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. If God had made the power of his word depend upon the speaker, if God had made the power of his word to depend upon the style of the speaking, uh, he would have chosen an angel rather than a human individual. And yet he put aside the angel for the humble creature, uh, human beings, a human person. In fact, the most prominent testimony, this is very interesting, the most prominent testimony of the resurrection in the first instance was that of the holy women. The holy women that went to the grave and did not find the Lord Jesus there. After that, each one of the people who made up the 500 who had the privilege of actually seeing the risen Lord, though they may have been quite unable to be eloquent in their description of it, I'm sure that every single one of the 500 people that saw the risen Lord alive spoke about it and witnessed about it. So, I have nothing to say beyond bearing witness to the fact that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead. That's what we're going to talk about. We'll be on that subject totally and completely. Our focus will be on that. There's a lesson in this, and the lesson is as follows. That if we know the truth of the resurrection, and if we feel the power of the resurrection, our mode of delivery is of secondary importance. Uh, people can be very poor at speaking, or people can be very shy, and yet if they give forth the testimony of the risen Lord uh, with courage, it has great impact, great impact. Because the Holy Spirit will bear witness to the truth, and will give the truth power, and will give the truth fruitfulness. Now our text is found in Paul's second letter to Timothy. Paul's an old man now, he's not really old, but he's going to die pretty soon. So he's old compared to Timothy himself. And the old man is concerned that his son in the gospel should preach the same truth that his father preached. That he ought not to water down the message in any way, that he ought not to alter it in any way. He was concerned that Timothy should not weaken the gospel in any way. There are three or four facts, plain facts, that constitute the gospel, just as Paul puts it in the 15th chapter of his first letter to the Corinthians. Here's what he said. He said, For I delivered unto you, first of all, now there you've got it, it's a primary truth, it's a leading truth, a truth that we speak about first of all. For I delivered unto you that which I also received. He's saying, I'm not speaking on my own. I'm not excogitating this truth on my own. This came to me from someone else. I received it from God. Then he goes on, how Christ died for our sins. Now these are primary truths, are right down at rock bottom of everything. God delivered the truth first of all to Paul, and he told about how Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. Max had been expounding from Isaiah, the 53rd chapter, and there you find it to be true. It was all told about in the scriptures in advance. And that he was buried and that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. It was all predicted hundreds of years in advance. Now my friends, our salvation depends upon, listen, I want you to hear it now, our salvation depends upon the incarnation, 
That's the Lord Jesus coming in human flesh as a human being. The life, the sinless life that is, and the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our salvation depends on our faith in Christ uh, with regard to these facts. He or she who believes these truths has believed the gospel. That is what the gospel is all about. The life, the death, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, his payment for our sins. So if you believe this, you believe the gospel. And believing the gospel, he or she, you and I, will with absolute certainty find salvation in the gospel. If we believe that, we're saved. And nothing can change that because we're resting on the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. But here's the problem. This is the problem. There is a problem here. That people are always hungry for something new. They want a new interpretation or they want something that they can talk about or look wise at or smart at or whatever. They're always hungry for something new. The gospel with variations is what people want. Now I love to listen to Bach. If you know me very well, you know that I like Bach very well. I love pipe organ music. And he often gives what we call variations on a theme. He'll state his theme and then he'll vary it as he goes along. And it's wonderful. It's quite extraordinary. I think it's almost miraculous what it can do with a theme. But when we're talking about the resurrection, we don't do variations on it. It's a story which is very clear, very factual, as it is. God came in human flesh. God lived in Christ a holy life, Christ the Son. Christ gave an atoning death. Do you know what that means? An atoning death is a death that pays for something. It atones for something. He atoned for our sins. And it speaks about a resurrection that really did happen. It wasn't just somebody's imagination or something that somebody made up. And having heard these things for 20 centuries, that's how long it's been now, having heard these things for 20 centuries, these people think it seems a little stale. And they want to invent something new. They want to make some alterations. They want to make something more philosophical or more easy to understand, as it were, from their viewpoint. So there is, in the world today, this hunger for something new when it comes to salvation. Now, there's nothing unusual about this. There's nothing new about it. Even in Paul's day, this tendency was obvious. People back in his day were trying to make changes to the gospel. There were people who were spirited away the resurrection. They wanted to make it altogether spiritual and nothing physical at all. And they made it mean something very deep and very spiritual as they told it. And in the process, they took away the actual resurrection altogether. The physical bodily resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, within the verse that is our text, several vital facts are recorded. Let me read the text once again. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Several great facts are recorded. First of all, there's the great truth that Jesus, the Son of Almighty God, is the Anointed One. The seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. He's the Anointed One. That means he's the Chosen One. That's what Anointed really means. He's the Messiah, chosen and sent by his Heavenly Father. He's called Jesus. And that means a Savior. That's what his name means. It means Jehovah is salvation. Uh, for another thing, it tells us that Jesus is Jehovah, along with his Father and along with the Spirit. But here you've got it. His name is Jesus. Jehovah is salvation. It's a grand truth that he was born of Mary. It's a grand truth that he was laid in the manger at Bethlehem. This one who loved us and lived for us and died for us is God's chosen Savior, the one that God sent. Now, we do not for a moment doubt about his mission. 
In fact, we hang our soul salvation on his mission. It's hung right there. That's where we have it. We hang our souls on salvation upon his being anointed or chosen of God to be the Savior of all those who believe in him. Now, this Jesus, this man called Jehovah is salvation, was really and truly a man. Paul says in our text of scripture that he was of the seed of David. That is to say he belonged to the family of David. The ancestry of David was there. It came through Mary's side of the family. Though he was divine, he was still in every respect a partaker of our human nature. He was a human being. He was tempted like as we are, yet without sin. He came as a descendant, as we say, of David. And we believe this. We believe it. We believe that in very flesh and blood, the Son of God, the Son of God came to live among humanity. He was bone of our bone and flesh of our flesh. Do you remember when Eve was created, she was taken from Adam's rib, and Adam saw her, and he said, this indeed is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Well, that's, it tells us something of a relationship to Christ with the human race. He was a human being, bone of our bone, and flesh of our flesh. We know and we believe that Jesus has come in the flesh. He is the incarnate God. He's God come in human flesh. And we love him with all our hearts. We love him as a fellow human being, a fellow human being as well as God. We fix our trust in him. That's what it means to be a Christian. It's also implied in our text that Jesus died. He could not be raised from the dead if he had not, first of all, gone down among the dead. If he was not one of them, Jesus died. The crucifixion was no delusion. It was no mistake, as it were, in seeing what was really happening. The piercing of his side with a spear was the most clear and absolute proof that he was dead. His heart was pierced. We read in the scriptures that there came forth blood and water. That would be blood and plasma, which looks like water, would have looked like water to them. It was a proof of death. When you die, the red cells separate from the plasma. So as a dead man, he was taken down from the cross, and he was carried by gentle hands to Joseph's never-used tomb. Not Joseph, his father, but Joseph of Arimathea, a rich man who donated his tomb to the use of the Lord Jesus. Rock of ages cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. And then he goes on to say, from this wound that he had flowed forth blood and water, and may our guilt be cured, and our sin be cured by what Jesus did there. I think I see this pale corpse you notice that he's stained with the wounds that he has. There are five of them. Did you know that five is a symbolic number of graves? If you look in the scriptures, it often stands for graves. Two wounds in the hands, two wounds in the feet, and his, the thorny crown, and the wound in his side. Forget the thorny crown. That wasn't the wound we're talking about, but the wound in the side. Five wounds, the number of the grace of God. Do you see how the holy women tenderly wrap him up in fine linen and fragrant spices and they leave him in the grave to spend the Sabbath day all alone in that rock-hewn sepulcher, that rock-hewn grave. He rested there, I suppose, because Sabbath is the day of rest in the Jewish um, Old Testament. So he rested there in the tomb on the Sabbath day. He was dead. My friends, no man in the world was ever more dead than he was. He made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. That's in Isaiah 53. 
they laid him in the place of the dead, and they put a, a, a napkin underneath him for him to lie on. And then they rolled the great stone at the grave's entrance, and they left him, and they left him because they knew that he was dead. And now comes the grand truth. As soon as the sun rose on that third day, I want you to try to imagine it now. I do it. I often think about it. The sun had not quite risen yet, but just at the very time, at that very time, as soon as the sun rose on that day, Jesus rose again. And his body had not decayed. Why do you think it was that his body hadn't decayed? Well, because he was holy. And his body could not see corruption. Peter talks about that in Acts the second chapter. Still, he had been dead. And by the power of God, let me put it this way, by his own power, because the Lord Jesus says, I have the power to lay my life down, and I have the power to take it up again. And by the Father's power, he was raised by the glory of God. The scriptures say that. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit is the spirit of life, he was raised again. So, before the Son had risen, here he is. His body is made alive. And how does that happen? This is what I think. It had to be this way. His silent heart began to beat. And the, the life blood began to circulate again. And the soul of our Redeemer took possession of the body again, and he was alive once more. And there he was, inside the sepulcher, and now he's alive. Now I'm not sure what he did uh, immediately. I think that he sat there on the slab for a while, looking around and viewing his circumstances. So here he is, he's literally in the sepulcher, but now he's alive as he's ever been. He's never been more alive than he is right now. He literally, in a material, physical body, came forth from the tomb to live among people until the hour of his ascension into heaven. Now this is a truth which is told to this very day. It's taught to this very day. And people can try all they like to refine it. They can try all they like to spiritualize it if they dare. But this is the historical fact which the apostles themselves and others witnessed back in that day and wrote about. It's absolutely consistent. It's absolutely true. It's the truth for which believers have bled and died. Unbelievers here recognize that. That people have believed in this truth, believed in the Christ of this truth, and have been prepared to die, and are dying right now because they believe in this truth. This is a teaching which is a keystone in the arch of Christianity. Do you know how they build arcs? They build them with the wedge-shaped rocks, and the rock on the top is called the keystone. And that arch, to remain and be strong, it has to be, that keystone has to be there. If it's not there, the whole lot collapses. And the resurrection of the Lord Jesus is the keystone in the arch of our faith. And those who do not hold it have thrown aside the essential truth of God. How can they hope for salvation? How can they hope for the salvation of their souls if they do not believe that the Lord is risen from the dead? Now there are three things that I want to do. Three things that I want to just, they're not points in the sermon, but three truths I want to bring out to you. And they're most important. They're foundational to our lives as Christian people. Three truths arising from the fact that Jesus arose from the dead. First of all, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus is a clear proof that there is another life. This is not it. It's yet to come. It's still coming. There was once a traveler, capital T, a traveler who said, I go to prepare, see he's going, he's a traveler, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go away, I will come again and receive you to myself, 
that where I am, there you may be also. And then he says again to his disciples, he says, a little time and you will see me. And again, a little time and you will not see me because I go to my Father. Do you remember those words? I'm sure you do. Our Lord Jesus went to the undiscovered country. He went to the country of the dead. Nobody had ever returned from that country, but he did. And here's what he said. He said, a little time, you'll see me. A little time, you'll not see me. And I go to my Father. So our Lord Jesus went to this undiscovered country, and he returned. And he said that on the third day, he would be back again. And he was true to his word. He did what he promised. So, if you're a Christian today, that is to say, if you're a believer, you have no doubt as to a future existence because Jesus existed after death. His resurrection is a promise. His resurrection is a pledge. It's a commitment that our bodies will rise again and that our bodies will rise to a superior condition. Do you remember what he said to Thomas? We call him Doubting Thomas, although in the end he wasn't doubting, but he wasn't first. The Lord Jesus had appeared to his disciples when Thomas wasn't there. And they hadn't seen him before. They'd heard that he was risen, but some of them didn't believe it until they saw him. But Thomas was not there. Later on he came and they said, The Lord has risen indeed! And Thomas said, Unless I can put my finger in the wounds in his hands and thrust my hand into the wound in his side, I will not believe. And then, a week later, the Lord Jesus appeared again, and Thomas was there. And the Lord said to him, Come, put your finger in the wounds of my hand, and thrust your hand in my side. And you know what Thomas said? He said, My Lord and my God. Do you know what that, how it was in the original language? It's the Lord of me and the God of me. That's the way that we translate it in the original. My Lord and my God. But there's still more. He was no longer despised and rejected of men. Now before he was crucified, everywhere he went, there was opposition. And that opposition was, was, uh, was murderous. In the end, they crucified him. But now, it's different. He's no longer despised and rejected. Now, glory surrounds him. It's quite clear that his risen, risen body could, could go from place to place in a single moment. Actually happened. When he appeared to the disciples before Thomas, he came there, the, the door was shut for fear of the Jews. He went straight through the wall. And he was glorified. Nobody could touch him then, as it were. Clear that he could go from place to place in a single moment. He actually did that. He appeared and vanished at will. So let us, as we think of the risen Christ, rest quite sure of a future life. I'm getting kind of old now. Well, I don't really mind because I'm not going to go to a finish. I'm going to go to a beginning. And it's going to be better than what I've had here. What I've had here is wonderful. Well, we can be certain of a future life. And quite, quite sure that our bodies are going to exist in a glorified condition. Just as his body existed in that way. And exists in that way. Another thing we learn. These are important truths. The rising of the Lord Jesus Christ is the proof of all his claims. Everything he said is proven to be true because he rose from the dead. It's the proof of his claims. In fact, he'd given this as a sign. He said that as Jonah was three days in the body of the whale, so should the Son of Man be three days in the heart of the earth. And that's the way that it was. And then to come forth in a new life again. And now in his resurrection, he proves it absolutely true. His resurrection is the absolute proof that Jesus is God. Christ is God. The Bible says this, as Romans 1.4, He was proved.
to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection, by his resurrection from the dead. And then another thing that he chose. The resurrection of our Lord, according to the scriptures, was the acceptance of his sacrifice. If his sacrifice had not been accepted, he would never have been raised from the dead. That's the proof of it. His resurrection from the dead was the absolute evidence that he actually endured the penalty which was due for my guilt and due for your guilt. The fact of the matter is, the Lord Jesus stood in the sinner's place. He stood in your place and in mine. And he dies for us. And when he has done that, there's nothing more, there's nothing more that can be demanded of him. The law says the wages of sin is death. But what is the law? The law is the transgression of the law. That's what sin is. And the proof of that transgression, the reality of it, the horror of it is that sin brings death. But here you've got the Lord Jesus. He pays, not for his sins. They were not sins that he committed. He pays for our sins, the whole load, at one time. And his payment is accepted. His resurrection proves that. Accepted. And he comes back from the dead. So here's Satan now. If he comes to any believer and says, well, what about your sin? You can tell him, my Savior lives. My Savior lives. And he is my assurance that I stand before God justified and free from all guilt. My friends, there's so much more. What can I say? Just this. We have always been victorious as Christians. Always. We've always been victorious. And we're victorious right now. We do not have to present atoning blood as Israelites had to do back in the Old Testament. We only have to conquer in Christ Jesus. You put on your white raiment. <laughs> How many of the Red Pilgrim Progress now? I ask you this question all the time. Well, quite a few. Do you remember how Pilgrim came, load on his back? He came and stood before the cross. And seeing the crucified one, the, law, the load fell off his back and into a sepulcher, a tomb prepared for it, was never seen again. And the one, there were three persons there, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The Father says, your sins are forgiven you. And the Son says, here, take my white garment. That's the garment of the righteousness of the Lord Jesus himself. Put it on. Wear it. And then the Holy Spirit gives him a scroll, which is to put in his bosom. And that scroll is his assurance, the certainty, the certainty of his salvation. Well, that's the way it is with us. We need to put on the white garment. All of you, as Christian people, you're judged as without sin before God because of what Christ did for you. God doesn't so much see you as he sees Christ in you. And so I want you to go forth now in the power of his resurrection. I'm going to close with a scripture reading. And it's taken, it, it, it begins where we finish the last reading. I want to talk about, I don't want to talk about, just to read this and this will be the end of it. But I want you to get this. It, it, it's just so extraordinary. Here it is from Luke, uh, chapter 24, starting with verse 13. And behold, two of them, these are the two on the road to Emmaus, were going that very day to a village called Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things which had taken place. They were talking and discussing Jesus. As they were doing that, Jesus himself approached them and began traveling with them. But their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are these words which you are exchanging with one another as you are walking? And they stood still, looking sad. One of them, named Cleopas, answered and said to him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem and are unaware of the things which happened here in these days? And he said to them, this is Christ speaking, what things? And he said to them, the things about Jesus, the Nazarene, 
who is a prophet mighty in deed and word in the sight of God and all the people, and how all the chief priests and the rulers delivered him to the sentence of death and crucified him. But we were hoping that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, it is the third day since these things happened. But also some women among, amongst us amazed us. When they were at the tomb early in the morning and did not find his body, they came, saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were present with us went to the tomb and found it exactly as the women also had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, this is the risen Lord now, O foolish men, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken, was it not necessary for Christ to suffer these things and enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, this is what we try to do. He was expounding the scriptures and what we try to do in our small way also. Beginning with the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in the scriptures, how he showed up even in the Old Testament again and again. And they approached the village where they were going and he acted as though he were going further. But they urged him saying, stay with us. For it is getting toward evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he had reclined at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed it, and breaking it, he began giving it to them. Then, now this is extraordinary, they were remembering the Lord Jesus as he instituted the Lord's Supper right back before his trial, not very long before this. So he began giving it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us on the road, while he was explaining the scriptures to us? And they got up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem, and found gathered together the eleven and those who were with them, saying, the Lord has really risen and has appeared to Simon. And they began to relate their experiences on the road and how he was recognized by them in the breaking of bread. We're going to be having the Lord's Supper very shortly, but I want you to do that. Recognize the Lord Jesus in the breaking of bread. God bless you. He's risen. He's risen.